skip. Are you going to make a s'more? Oh, it looks good. Looks like you had a recent rain spell. We did, yes. <laughs> we, we got a little bit of rain this morning, but um, night before last, we got a big torrential deluge and that made a bit of a mess for us. Yeah. Not too bad, we've had worse. Um, but ordinarily, yes, we would excavate um, down there in those squares and then up here at these tables, we sift it all through a quarter inch mesh and then a window screen mesh. also pretty highly regimented and highly regulated uh, and those 70 or so soldiers here in the 1770s uh, would have been eating in some ways a very plain uh, a very regular diet uh, there are military writers at the time in the mid to late 18th century who say that a soldier's diet should be uh, well regulated and uh, uh, well chosen uh, you know trying to keep them healthy uh, because 
a soldier who is eating well, getting enough calories, is going to be an effective soldier. They're not going to necessarily be getting sick or anything like that. Now, ideally, if these soldiers who are here in the 1770s were posted, for instance, somewhere in Britain, every day uh, there would be a few of those soldiers selected to go to the local market and buy fresh food, buy fresh meat, fresh vegetables that are being brought in from uh, outlying farms and market gardens. We don't have any of that here. It dry salted where it's just packed in salt and it's, uh, it's all dried out. Uh, uh, or it could be brined, so shipped in kind of like a big barrel like this uh, full of salt water. Uh, again, a lot of protein in here. Also a whole bunch of calories in here because it's, it's mostly fat. Uh, again, ideally, in Britain, if a market were available, you'd be getting fresh meat, and ideally fresh beef, uh, and then pork and perhaps mutton if, uh, if beef were not available. Uh, here at Michelin-Mackinac and elsewhere in the Great Lakes, it seems like they're invariably getting salt pork. This is actually probably coming from Ireland uh, in the 18th century, so it's being loaded up in Dublin, shipped across the Atlantic, uh, up to St. Lawrence, trans-shipped, placed on maybe a canoe or a bateau or maybe a sailing vessel uh, for transportation out here. Um, so again, it's just something that uh, provides a minimum amount of protection uh, that keeps frost, stuff like that off. Uh, and then behind that row house over there, we've got a um, basically a cold frame, which is truly a miniature greenhouse. Uh, it's, so it's about that tall. It's got two lights or windows on it. Uh -huh. Those are completely removable. Um, again, just something that you can use to offer a little bit of protection, a little miniature hot house rather than building a whole separate structure. Um, we know that somewhere around 2,000 people were coming here every summer in the 1770s. Um, and most of those people were here involved in the fur trade. So if you're involved in the fur trade, does it make sense to grow things here or does it make sense to import things? So what we're going to find throughout the tour is that no one here was ever really self-sufficient. Most people relied very heavily on imported things. And so um, what we're going to do is walk around the fort a little bit. We'll meet a few of our other staff people and they're going to be talking about various aspects of that topic, of what makes a garden here and how people are able to eat at Michelin Mackinac. And then once you get to the point where you're ready to take the fire out, having a little shovel like this is nice. It has a particular quality to it that quickens cell regeneration. So. Uh, it, it makes you heal faster, whether it's a skin ailment or an internal ailment. Although doctors today say that uh, comfrey can cause uh, liver damage, I believe, so we don't drink it anymore. Um, our rose bushes just started blossoming, so we've got probably two or three more weeks of flowers, and then they'll form big red rose hips on, on the bushes. If you rub the leaves or touch the leaves a little bit, they smell really, really beautiful and you can actually make tea out of them. But one of the interesting things about black currants is that they are very hardy. out of the soil sometimes so actually sand is ideal for them to grow in um, and then when you cook them they've got this taste that's reminiscent of oysters a really nice root vegetable with a very unique taste 
and then after they flower, um, which these yellow flowers kind of remind a lot of folks of dandelions, after they flower, we will collect seed from those, and that'll be our seed for next year. They have really large villages that they settle into and have massive agricultural fields where they're growing everything from beans to corn, squash, pumpkins, artichokes, sunchokes, and sunflowers. And then in the fall, they're going off in canoes to collect wild rice that grows out here. They call it monomen. And in the winter, they kind of form smaller villages, stay for the winter, go out hunting deer, moose, elk, beaver, geese, um, and you're fishing. They're fishing year round. This is a garden trowel that's under construction. It's missing the wooden handle. It has most of the same parts, but it's flat rather than curved like modern trowels are. But basically all these are being shipped in. They're being made really quickly and cheaply in purpose-built facilities. But once those things get out here, they wear out, they break, and it would have been the job of the blacksmith to maintain them. Most of the tools that are breaking out here are guns. They've got lots of small little parts that wear out and break pretty quickly. The spider's been catching lots of bugs. Yes, he has. I'm going to go around clockwise.
here is their garden. Commanding officer's garden. Yep. Defensive role to play here at the fort. As you wander around and take a close look at some of the other weapons that we've got scattered about, those are all kind of general purpose. You could use them offensively, you could use them defensively. They're just here to kind of have them. This weapon, however, out of the 11 pieces of ordnance that the British military maintained at Mishpomackinac in the 1770s, had a very specific defensive role to play. And that's not what this weapon is intended for. Uh, in, in regular service, this is an offensive weapon. It's primarily for use in siege warfare. Uh, and sieges are kind of long, protracted operations. They move slowly. This is not a rapid fire weapon by any means. So I'm gonna get Steven started by telling him to load. He's gonna start to get the, uh, uh, the barrel cleaned out, cooled down. He's going to take a sponge uh, that he's gonna dip in a little bit of water, clean out the inside of that barrel. Again, a siege in the 18th century may have lasted for weeks or months. There are even sieges that last for multiple years, lasting from the 1770s into the 1780s. And you can imagine something like this being fired repeatedly, every hour, every day, every week, every month. You want to make sure that it's safe to load more gunpowder inside. So that's what Stephen's going to do next. And this weapon does not require a whole lot of gunpowder. Uh, it takes maybe four ounces uh, because this is not a long-range weapon. The idea with a mortar is not to shoot all the way over to the Upper Peninsula. We're, we're never going to be able to do that really with any of the weapons here. But some of the long guns, the cannons, they might have a maximum range of about, about a mile. This weapon can reach a couple hundred yards. You see that the barrel is at that fixed 45 degree angle. It's always going to launch its projectile up in the air in a high arc and drop it back down. And again, if you're thinking about using this in a siege, that means that you are attacking some sort of fortified place, some place like Mishlamagno. You can see we've got our, our 20 foot walls here. If everybody's ears are covered, the last two commands are make ready, fire. Holy crap. So there you have a mortar firing. Just 
about ready to fire. But what do you need to do next if you actually want to hit something? Target. Aim, yes. Yeah. So the next man will be take aim. And this truly is where practice makes perfect and where the additional training that artillery soldiers received came into play. So you can see there's a big screw underneath the breech that changes the elevation of the barrel. You can also use that spike at the back to point to the right or the left. And again, a well-trained artillery uh, soldier or uh, soldiers uh, could hit targets pretty regularly with these pieces. So with all that being complete, we are now just about ready to fire. I do want to warn you though, this will be a little bit loud. One of the ways that we know that they were firing for practice here is that people wrote about it, but those people were miles away and they could just hear the guns being exercised. Not going to be firing quite as much powder as they would have historically, but I would still recommend that you all cover your ears. And if everybody's ears are covered, the last two commands are going to be make ready, fire. This is what we came to Michigan for. Lilacs. Smells good. Oh. Oh. My day has been made. Mm.